Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tacoma Cyclist. I am the Tacoma Cyclist, and with me, as sometimes, as of lately, is the Boogeyman. And today we're going to address uh, a common question that we get, whether it's in the comments or fellow racers or whatever else. Uh, we've seen this frequently, which is uh, either a comment of, I get in so much pain when I'm on the trainer, uh, particularly in the crotchal region, uh, or I'm uncomfortable, or I can't be on the trainer for that long. Now, other than the mental aspect of being on the trainer for a long period of time, which we are not going to address, there are plenty of uh, physical components of being on the trainer for an extended period of time, which we will address. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to break it down into three components here. Uh, kit, the setup on the bike, and your fit on the bike. So those three things, kit, kit choice, bike setup, and your, your fit on the bike. We will not be going into detail about bike fit here. Uh, I do strongly believe that bike fitting is very important. And if you have the wherewithal to go get a bike fit, uh, you should do that. Uh, I'll address a couple things within the bike fit component here that are relatively specific, but I'm not gonna, this is not a bike fitting video. Okay, so first things first, let's talk a little bit about kit. And today the Boogeyman is going to be our model. So first things first, you want to make sure when you're working out on the trainer to get a quality kit. I know this sounds weird to spend good money on a kit that's never going to see the light of day. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people talk about how they get their super cheap kit from like Amazon or AliExpress or whatever. And I will tell you uh, some of those off-brand kits, they don't invest the time and money into a good quality chamois nor do they uh, invest the time and quality into the materials themselves. Uh, one of the things that's going to give you saddle sores and make you feel very uncomfortable is if the kit does not properly wick away sweat uh, from all of the areas, whether that's the crotchal region or whether that's seams, which can become very irritated, armpits, things of that nature. Now, some people prefer to wear nothing on top, just the bibs themselves, and that's cool if that works for you. We'd like to stay monetized, so we're not going to be shooting any uh, porn for YouTube. So get a good quality kit. That's number one. Number two, I'm afraid to tell you this. Uh, if you don't already know this, then here's your introduction to it. Cycling shorts are not designed to have underwear underneath of them. Okay. If you're riding with underwear underneath of your chamois, then what's happening is the moisture is getting absorbed in that. Underwear, for the most part, unless it's highly technical underwear, is not designed to wick sweat. In fact, it gets really, really gross. And when it gets gross and moist, oh, this is just, I, I can't believe I'm having to say this, it creates problems. It's bacteria, it's itching, it's discomfort, it also bunches up, which creates hot spots. If you're wearing underwear and you're on the trainer, stop. It's okay to wear cycling kit without it. In fact, you don't ever want to wear underwear with cycling kit. I, it's just wrong. Don't do it. Okay. Uh, and then really number three is the quality of the chamois. So you want to make sure that, you know, we've already talked about the quality of the kit. The kit itself should be wicking, uh, moisture wicking should be advanced technical fabric. That doesn't always mean it has to be the most expensive one. In fact, uh, check up here, up here, up here, I think. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and place a link right above the boogeyman's ponytail uh, on uh, our review of black bibs, which he's wearing right now. Um, the black bibs are a very affordable alternative to a higher end cycling kit that is uh, both affordable and incredibly high quality. So you can get a pair of good bibs for 40 bucks. Uh, well worth the money. Uh, certainly better than the offerings you're gonna find on Amazon for that price. Okay. For this next one, we're gonna have the boogeyman get on the bike. Go ahead, boogeyman. Because for this portion of the video, we're talking about bike setup. Go ahead and clip all that in. Thank you. Now, when you are riding on the trainer, what you're gonna find by nature, by default, is that you feel more stretched out. This is normal. Do not alter your bike setup to accommodate for that, because what you're gonna find is that when you go back to the road, it's gonna feel not just different, but quite wrong, and it could in fact be dangerous. Uh, it could injure you, could cause you to have lack of stability if you try to shorten this reach. 
the reason this is, is because when you're on the road bike, on the actual road, you're shifting around a lot more than you think you are. But when you're on the trainer, it doesn't make sense to, to shift around a lot unless you're uncomfortable. So what happens is you find that you're stretched out a significant amount here, which the reality is, is this is actually a good angle. It's almost dead on it, between a 90 and a 100 degree angle here, which is exactly what we're looking for. Now, if the boogeyman were to assume his official race position, now we're almost at a dead 90 degree angle, which is exactly what we would want on the road. However, when he brings his arms back up again, we're at a slightly wider angle here, this feels uncomfortable and it's gonna tend to push you into different places on the bike. Again, this is because you don't ride like this on the bike most of the time. Uh, you may alter your position by getting on the tops. And notice that decreases that angle, makes it feel as though you're shorter. You may actually sit straight up sometimes when you're riding on the bike, maybe no hands. Feel free to do this if you are, in fact, regularly riding like this from time to time. Just do it every once in a while. I would not encourage you to spend the majority of your time on the trainer doing this. This is not working anything out, but it's a good way to rest um, and just get the blood flowing back in. But we can come back down here. Again, you are going to feel more stretched out. Don't feel that this is um, unusual in any way. Okay, uh, next bit of advice is something that I think is very important for pain caves. And I'm going to step slightly out of the way here. The boogeyman's laptop, which is actually dark at the moment, we just finished working out, uh, is directly in front of him. So if you were to see this, what you're going to see is that the center line, which is very easy to tell on this because he's got a webcam, comes right through the center line of the bike. Now this is important because when you're on the trainer, if you're having to crane your body or your neck, then you're creating imbalance in the hips, and you're creating imbalance in the upper body, and you're creating imbalance in the head. So I know a lot of people will have a stand over here with their computer on it or on the other side or on an adjacent wall. If you have the ability to move your pain cave set up in a different way so that way you are centered, that's always going to be preferred. Now, if you also notice here, we have a TV uh, which is not centered. In fact, it's centered between the two bikes. My bike is over here. Boogeyman's bike is here and the TV is in between. Uh, this type of setup is obviously going to create some imbalance if you're sitting there staring at the TV. If you need to have a TV, which if you're going to be on the trainer for a long time, you probably do. If you can go above your current setup, different than what we've done here, um, feel free. We have it between because there's two of us in the room, and when you have two in the room, if you put it directly in front of me, then it's going to be very awkward for the other person. So in this case, we try to just look out the corner of the eye and not actually turn the body. If you're turning the body, again, you are creating significant imbalances in the hip and you'll find that you get a hot spot particularly um, on the hip that is uh, opposing the turn so if you're turned in it's on the outer hip that's going to cause that hot spot so yeah that's going to be a, a problem um, so keep everything centered now one last thing uh, that i'm going to talk about with regards to bike setup and that is the use of wheel chocks these are two popular types of wheel chocks here. Um, kind of popular, this is a cheapo $5 Amazon special. Uh, and actually I have a different one below our bikes, which is the one that came with our Elite Suido trainers. But this is a very low height, low profile wheel chock. And this is one I see very commonly, which is a multi-variable height um, Cyclops. Um, back before they were Cirrus, I think. Uh, the purpose of this is to create the potential for different heights uh, of front wheel adjustment. I have seen recently some comments on the internet saying you should really prop up the front wheel of the bike when you're doing a uh, when you're putting it on the trainer because the, the absurdity of it is well when you're outside riding the wind is pushing against you and the wind is pushing you back. Okay first of all that's not how wind works uh, unless you're riding into some significant significant winds you still can adjust the front angle of your body pretty easily. Um, but I'm going to show you where the real problem lies. Okay, you can use a digital level for this or you can use a traditional spirit bubble level. In this case you'll notice that the front of the bike is ever so slightly tilted up and that is using the default block here. Uh, I don't, and I say default block, I mean the, the stock block from the Elite Suido. Um, if you watch my previous video for the unboxing, which I'll put up here, um, then you will notice that I said that it does in fact raise the tilt of the saddle by about a degree to a degree and a half. Um, that type of increase is 
probably not going to cause you any issues over time. However, a significant increase, indulge me for a moment, by using a block like this, is likely to cause you some serious discomfort. And that is really simple because the nose of the saddle is now tilted up six to seven degrees. That doesn't compensate for wind. That just places a significant amount of pressure on those delicate areas uh, that you don't want a lot of pressure. This is not a solution. If you feel like you need to feel the increase or the rise of the bike whilst going up and down hills, I would strongly encourage you to invest in something like the kick or climb. But simply putting a wheel chalk underneath your bike like this, all this is going to do is put increased pressure in areas where you don't want increased pressure. So stick with a very low profile wheel chalk if you even have to have one. Uh, I encourage them just because I don't like the feeling of my wheel flopping around on the front, but I use a very, very low profile one. It raises the saddle less than one degree. All right, so I've moved the camera in a little closer on this because what we're going to talk about now is uh, overall bike fit. Now, if you haven't been to a bike fitter, uh, there are a couple things that you can do at home that uh, everyone can do and are relatively safe with regards to if you do these things, you're not going to create an injury for yourself. Uh, in fact, you can free yourself up from potential injury by doing these things. What I'm holding in my hand here is called a goniometer. It measures angles. This is a standard tool in the physical therapy world and are very inexpensive to get in this format on Amazon or a lot of other places. Uh, it's going to measure angles just simply by placing these straight lines on straight lines on your leg and then it'll tell you what your measurement is at. So real simply, one of the most common problems that I see uh, in studying bike fit, in working on bike fit is, and this is like 80%. I see this on riders out on the course. I see this uh, on local riders. Saddle height is too high. Your saddle height probably, if you're watching this video, your saddle height is probably too high. Statistically speaking, it's really, really likely. A couple different ways we can determine proper saddle height. Boogeyman's gonna show us one, which is to unclip the one leg, place the heel of the leg flat down on the pedal, and then pedal down. And essentially, at full extension, his heel should just barely be on that cleat. Now, the problem with this is, you are naturally going to, go ahead and start pedaling for me you are naturally gonna start rocking the hips. Notice how his upper body is shifting and he's naturally rocking that hip downward. This is a very bad way of measuring this and if you think that you're getting proper saddle height by doing this, you probably are overextending because you're naturally rocking your hip down. Your hips should be stable. Now, just because he's rocking his hip doesn't mean his saddle height is too high. Go ahead and clip back in. Each person has a different angle that their body wants to be at. I don't want to get too deep into the science of it, but I will tell you that the boogeyman and I have the exact same inseam, but his saddle height is about 30 millimeters higher than mine. And that's just because of the way that the angles of our bodies work. He tends to be a little bit more stiff and restricted in the hips, where I tend to be a lot more loose in the hips. His ankle tends to aim, aim a little bit more down, which still is in the same region, but his, um, and, and therefore he can extend his uh, leg uh, a little bit less, which means that he can be a little higher up. Now, okay. Let's bust this goniometer out. And the way that you're going to test this, if you happen to have a second person that can do this, this is great. At the end of the pedal stroke, what we're going to want to do is we're going to place this brad right here on the bony protrusion in the knee. And we're going to essentially run a straight line. This is not going to be perfect because you may be off a, measure, a millimeter or two in any one direction, but it's going to get us really, really close. And that's what we're after here because we have a range that we want to be within. So what we want to do naturally, by the way, is have the boogeyman pedal a few revolutions, maybe 10 to 15 revolutions. And then we want to stop so that the crank arm is not straight up and down. That's not full extension. You've already passed full extension. You want to stop so that the crank arm is directly in line with the seat tube. And once you've done that, then you can measure that angle. So go ahead and pedal a little bit faster. You want to pedal somewhat naturally. And then once you've gotten that natural pedal stroke, go ahead and stop. And we want that to be pretty darn close to straight up and down. 
And in this case, we are measuring about a 33 degree, let's see if you can get in on that, about a 33 degree angle. Now I've seen a lot of different specifications as far as what is the ideal angle and what is the, the incorrect angle. And I've seen some that say as low as 20 or 25 degrees. If you see that, throw it out, discard it, that's ridiculous. If you're doing that, you will be causing damage to your knees. 30 degrees to 35 degrees is a relatively safe and consistent angle. That's going to keep you from overextending and that's going to keep you from having injury down in your knees and in your quads and your hamstrings and your IT band. 30 to 35 degrees. So he's sitting smack dab in the middle of that range and that's not by accident. We use pretty sophisticated tools to measure that out and make sure that he's in the proper position every time. So that is incredibly important. Now one other consideration when we're talking about this positioning is also important. And this goes back to what I had said earlier, and that is your saddle fore and aft position, okay? And I'm sure if you bought your bike from a bike shop, they probably used one of these to do your bike fitting, a plumb bob. Now, this goes back to the old knee over pedal spindle concept of bike fitting. And essentially what it means is that as the boogeyman is positioned like you would normally be riding, go ahead and pedal a few more strokes, that he's gonna to wanna to stop with his crank arm directly in the forward position. And essentially, we wanna be able to drop this plumb bob down and it should intersect the point on his shoe that is directly over the pedal spindle. So it should, the, the tip of the plumb bob should essentially hit the pedal spindle. Now, there's a lot of science that has basically debunked knee over pedal spindle or cops, but, Here's one important thing. While it's been debunked as a primary method of using to get bike fit, it's still actually a pretty good protocol to determine if your leg is in the right place. Now, if you're forward or behind that a little bit, a few millimeters in any one direction, probably don't have anything to worry about. If you're wildly off, you've got something going on and it could be your saddle fore aft position. Now, every time you move anything on a bike, it doesn't matter if I'm talking saddle position vertically, you have a secondary movement or even sometimes a tertiary movement, a second or third or beyond set of movements that you've now impacted. So if I change the position of a seat uh, forward and back, I also need to impact the up and down because now it's changed his relationship with his angles of his legs. Uh, and so, so on, if I do that, I also need to think about reach to his bars and saddle, uh, bar, bars and uh, um, stem rather. So um, you wanna take these types of things very carefully. But if you see that you're 10, 15, 20 millimeters off, um, maybe it's too far back by that far, go ahead and stand up off the bike there, Boogeyman. You don't have to actually get off the bike, but stand up so you're off the saddle. Okay, if you see that your saddle is slammed on the rails as far forward or as far back as you possibly can, and notice he's got a good 15 millimeters space there, there so he's not slammed. Uh, and a lot of saddles have a lot more latitude than this. This is a very tight, set of rails. If you're slammed and it's in the direction that obviously makes it so you're too far forward or too far back, according to that measurement, make that adjustment. Now that may very well adjust or impact your bars and your stem and your saddle height. So if you, if you slide this forward and back a significant amount, consider also remeasuring with that goniometer and seeing how your knee position is. Okay. And the final topic here uh, is your cleats. And interestingly enough, when I'm doing a bike fit, this is the first place I start and it's the last place I finish is cleat positioning. Now I could spend a lot of time talking about cleat positioning because I think it's incredibly important, but then the video would be too long and boring. So I'm not gonna do that. What I'm gonna tell you very, very briefly is there's two pr pr uh, primary critical components of cleat placement. First and foremost, and I'll use mine as an example, is your fore aft positioning on the cleats. It is generally considered uh, uh, um, Kind of accepted knowledge that you want to have the cleat pretty far back as far back as you more or less possibly can you'll notice i have a little bit of wiggle room here but essentially what you want is you want the center line of your cleat to intersect where the big toe and the little toe knuckles reside on your feet so right now it's at an angle runs right through here and the boogeyman's cleat is positioned so that the spindle is directly below that position on the foot there are advantages to having it further forward and there are advantages to having it further back, but those are trade-offs because when you add any advantage, you also add a disadvantage or a, a, you subtract a, an advantage from doing that. So having that in that center position is kind of a balanced ideal 
And if you're an advanced cyclist and you decide that you want to change one aspect of your cycling, you can move that forward or back to adjust that. Just bear in mind again, if you move it in one direction from that center, you may be negatively impacting something else. In fact, you will be negatively impacting something else. However, in doing this, what you're likely gonna do is reduce hot spots in your feet, which is a common complaint on a trainer. You're gonna give yourself more stability overall on the foot, so you're not gonna have foot cramps or, or pains in your feet if you have that position properly. Now, the other component of this is the side-to-side -side profile of the cleat. And I wanna point out probably the simplest way to determine if you're in the proper position on your cleats. This is really, really easy. You can do it by yourself, but you can also have somebody help you with it. And what I wanna have done here, Boogeyman has a two degree float cleat, and that's it, just two degrees of float. Most cleats, like these, have anywhere between six and 10 degrees of float, and some have as much as 15 degrees of float. So we don't have a whole lot to work with here when we're talking about side to side motion. What I want the Boogeyman to do is I want him to pedal a couple revolutions, and then I just want him to stop, stop where his foot feels natural, maybe 15 revolutions. All right, that's good. And what I'm gonna to try to feel for now, I'll wait for that to stop. What I'm trying to feel for now is, was his foot at the maximal position of a cleat? In other words, could I push it anymore or could I pull it anymore? If it was in this particular case, there was no movement that way. There was a little bit of movement of this way, but that's, again, there's only two degrees of float. If he stops pedaling, and you want to do this like three or four times. You don't want to do it just once because your foot's going to naturally land in different places. But if it's always at that one spot, that means your cleat angle needs to be more that direction. So uh, because his foot is naturally pressing against that cleat in that position, that means that he's creating tension. This is probably the best way for a home fitter to figure this out. Okay, There's all sorts of sophisticated tools. I've got lasers that we use to measure and all that, and it's pretty cool. But Ideally, your foot should be kind of in the middle of that uh, float. Or, or if not dead set in the middle, it shouldn't be pegged on one side or the other. And if it is, that tells you that you need to adjust your cleat in that other direction. Now again, anytime you make one measurement or one change here, it's going to have a ripple effect throughout the rest of the bike. Uh, so just bear in mind that once you finish this, you might want to remeasure that knee angle. You might want to remeasure that distance, all that kind of fun stuff. All told, this could take 20 minutes. And if you do it for, if you spend the 20 minutes to do this, you are gonna be much more comfortable on the bike. Uh, overall, it's just gonna be a, a totally different world. So to recap, get the right kit, get a kit with a good chamois, get quality fabrics. Don't wear your underwear, <laughs> just don't. If you're gonna use a wheel chalk, use a light one, a short one. Um, make sure you adjust your position on the bike periodically so you don't get stuck in any one position and make sure your computer is directly in front of you. On the bike, make sure your saddle height is correct, 30 to 35 degree knee angle when you're at full extension, check your fore and aft position of the cleats, and check your wiggle position of the cleats. Once you do that, you should be able to ride on the trainer pretty much as long as you can remain sane while riding on the trainer, and that can be pretty tough. Anytime you go over two hours on the trainer, uh, it takes a, a lot of mental power, more than physical power. So, that's how you remain comfortable on the bike. So we hope you found that video helpful and informative. Uh, and if you have any questions about what we've stated and shown in this video, please feel free to put them down there in the comments below. Um, if you have any feedback, maybe you disagree with something I've said here, that's fine too. Um, controversy is always a good thing or, or challenge and uh, uh, respectful discourse is always a good thing. So put it down below. Uh, we would love it if you would share this video with your friends, especially your friends that train on Zwift or any other platform because Maybe they need the help on this too. Um, we spend an awful lot of time on the bikes, watching TV and working out. And if we weren't comfortable, we really wouldn't want to do it. So uh, hopefully maybe some of the lessons that we've learned can help you throughout this entire process too. Uh, again, share it, smash that like button. We really want the likes. Uh, it helps us out a great deal, so do that. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe. We'd love it if you subscribed. Other than that, Hang around, check out some more videos if you like, and we'll have more content coming real soon. Thanks a bunch, and see you next time.